I am hitting record. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Produce department, I'm going to, Chris, go ahead and talk to this a bit, but this is a, obviously a pick of our Livingston store. Can you got to get off mute, Chris? Yeah, he's working on it. There you go. Hi, guys. Uh, Bill, do you want to focus on produce or kind of the concept itself, how it started and, and, and what we've done with it thus far? Yeah, uh, let's do that. Uh, but I want everybody in the association to understand the freshness and the fullness of the product that we, we will be supplying. And this is a great representation of all of our stores, not just, you know, I didn't just cherry pick one store for, for the group. Yeah, the, so you guys, the Rancher San Miguel concept, uh, we have several of them up and down the valley. We compete with the, what I would say are the largest Hispanic retailers uh, in California coming out of Los Angeles. Uh, it, it's a Hispanic store, but it's a store for everybody. What's unique about our concept, yes, we have fresh produce and we have a, a great variety of fresh produce. We have a service meat counter. We have a salsa bar with, uh, ceviche uh, and fresh uh, salsas. We have a uh, panderia uh, with, with fresh scratch uh, bakery items. But, but really the, the other unique thing and the reason, one of the other reasons we've been highly successful is we run more of a EDLP operation. We, we our, 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 our parent company is a Food for Less, which was a price impact store. Rancho San Miguel, will be very competitive in pricing where historically uh, or traditionally a lot of the uh, Hispanic driven uh, retailers are not as uh, center store driven on being competitive, competitive on everyday groceries. Any, any questions guys? Yes. Please. Um, uh, can you pull the, can you um, just peel the layers back a little bit and talk um, in depth a little bit about sourcing? Where is the product coming from? Who are your suppliers and what's their makeup of those suppliers? Sure. sure. So UNFI is our primary produce supplier. We source locally, we source regionally, and we source uh, as many re retailers do out of country when necessary. So we, we really uh, will pull strawberries out of Salinas. We'll pull cherries local. Uh, we really outsource uh, a multitude of different uh, places, but we definitely support local uh, when it's, uh, when it's uh, possible, uh, regional, and then many times uh, certain seasons are not in crop and they come from Mexico. So when you say that UNFI, so you said UNFI is your distributor? Correct. Okay, so um, let me j just dive in a little bit deeper then. Um, do you have control over who Unify uh, sources their product from? So for example, let's be specific. Can you tell me how many uh, African-American suppliers that you have currently that are, uh, that are represented within your supply chain? No, I couldn't tell you that. I'm on the California Grocers Association board and I couldn't tell you that with any of our suppliers to be candid with you. Exactly. Which there, there lies a, a problem again. Um, and so I won't take up too much time, but I think if we're going to be intentional and, and really look at and, and talk about equity as well, you're coming into a, a community that has been, um, it's regentified, but it was heavily populated by African-Americans. We don't have as much representation there now, but there is, which is diversity is great. And I love the fact that there is diversity, but also we have to look at equity from a standpoint of hey, what are my suppliers? What are those makeups? And how is that going back in the community? There's one thing to have jobs in the community and you represent people that look like me, but what about people that look like me that don't have their farms, but they have products? And so we're looking for you, Chris, um, to have an opportunity to lead and ensure us that there's gonna be representation of suppliers. And if you don't know how to find those suppliers, we can help you with that. Um, and so I just, I just wanted to lend that information to you. Um, UNFI, I'm very familiar with them. Um, and a lot of times, understanding the corporate structure of that, they lock out 
uh, minority suppliers because of the demand. So what are you all doing specifically to ensure that there's equity for suppliers that are underrepresented as a company? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Matthew. I can tell you this. I can tell you as a CGA board, it's a topic of discussion at this point in time. Uh, not only suppliers, but uh, really uh, driving people and equity into this industry as a whole. In other words, there is a uh, Cal Poly has a grocery program but that's not indicative of the makeup of the state of California. So we're addressing those issues where we can. Uh, so I, I would be interested in any in, input or direction you have. I will say this, is, and this is gonna lead me down another path off the subject, but we have partnered in Stockton with, uh, uh, with the Community Medical Center James Mackey, a personal friend of mine, we're gonna skip some slides, but I have a son who has been incarcerated. I'm very familiar with drug addiction. So we are huge supporters of a uh, second chance, if you wanna say, or returning community members. I can tell you in the last two months, uh, just through that program alone and not our normal hiring practice, through that program that I'm passionate about and uh, this company's allowed me the resources through that returning community member program alone, in the last two months, we've hired 13 African-American workers, six Hispanic and four Caucasian. Uh, so we are very passionate about that. We're very passionate about diversity in this company. Uh, as far as suppliers, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole nother challenge that we're, we're interested in working on and sure. Well, I, I can appreciate it, Chris, and, and I love to move from place from discussion because we've been discussing these things for over 175 years, and uh, it always seems to be ending in discussions. And when I ask a question, it's 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 I love the fact that we can always you know talk about you know the, the individuals that we are representing that we're helping with jobs. But again, if we're going to talk about equity, we really have to hone that in and look for ways and partners and collaborations so that we can make sure that there is equity in that. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I, I love the fact that this concept is coming, but nothing is worse than a concept that comes in and there's no representation of, of the community. Um, and that's product standpoint, you know? And so again, you have a, a, a grocery store, which I understand grocery stores are, you know, difficult and, and it's a franchise, right? So I get that there's things that are consistent. And so it makes it easy for UNFI to come in as a distributor but I need you all to work harder as a team to find the workarounds to ensure that we can have representation and equity as soon as that store opens. And I'm not sure if maybe it's carving out a space um, for these suppliers, um, again, to make sure that they have a place um, in this market if it's about the community, opposed to being any other market that comes into our communities. And again, um, we're not represented as, as a people in that piece and we get back to the equity piece. So I appreciate that. I look forward to having some offline discussions with you and your team to figure out how we um, move from a place beyond just a discussion um, and, 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 and really move it into action in dollars and cents. So thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and I, I'd just like to piggyback, piggyback on what Matthew uh, is, was saying. Um, one of my, um, and I understand, you know, it's hard, you know, I, I looked at the city's process of, of um, pursuing a grocer. Um, one of my things is, is that I look at the hot foods calendar, right? To look at diversity. Um, and so we have La Mercados, we have La Superiors, like literally right down the street, right? And now we're opening up another uh, Hispanic themed store. And so again, you know, I understand, you know, how the grocery uh, uh, business works and whatever, but do you have any flexibility to allow uh, local chefs, uh, uh, black African-American chefs to come in and maybe have a piece of the hot foods counter so we can get a diversity of, of foods that will be served inside the store. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll let Bill, I, I will talk to you right now, OC and uh, Wilson and I were talking earlier. We're, we're, we're already challenged with the square footage, footage provided to us in that specific location in the kitchen. Our concern right now at this point is is, is, is really, we're trying to stretch the store to make sure we have room to have a big enough kitchen to serve the needs of the community. 
Uh, I'll let Bill, Bill trumps me, but I don't know how, when we already don't have enough space to operate the kitchen the way we would like, we would allocate space for an independent operator operate in the store. Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Um, I think that was Jonathan, right? If I had my name writing down right. Uh, Jonathan, I guess I'm, I'm interested to listen and understand more what concept you're trying to, to do there. Uh, we did desire to have our hot foods match the neighborhood. Certainly Rancho San Miguel is a Hispanic format, but we, we do know that um, these my numbers, I could have this wrong. I think 26% of the population is African-American. And so we did think there would be a, a tailoring of our food offerings uh, in, in that fashion. So, but bringing in an independent to, uh, to have space in our store uh, could be difficult, but uh, I keep an open mind right now. Would you be open to um, uh, uh, utilization of the parking lot? So say, you know, food truck, something like that. We have to understand, understand what our parking needs are, how full the parking lot is. I mean, Bill, I'll let you again comment on that. Yeah, it's it's small, and and I think you guys know there's a couple other uh, businesses that also utilize that parking lot. Um, how, you know, how much space? What are we talking? Uh, time of day, time of week, all that kind of stuff comes into play. So um, I'm not here to say no. I'm here to to listen and understand. And so uh, I'll leave it there. I think for now. Any other questions before we pitch it back to, to Bill and Chris to continue the presentation? Okay, so uh, if there is none other, let me finish out this slide and then I'll go back a couple. So one of the things we did want to reiterate, and this is the commitment we had made to the city of Sacramento, that we uh, have a hiring goal of 75% of our higher needs uh, will come from those four zip codes that were identified as the city told us as the project area. This is not so unusual for us. We normally hire from the communities that we serve. Uh, it certainly is an objective of ours and we're serious about that, but I did wanna make that recommitment to uh, this association tonight. There's no questions on that. I'll, I've got a couple slides on the ESOP, but let me pause for a minute. Okay, so the company became an ESOP in November of 2019. Our founders sold the company to their employees. In total, the employee count is around 1,800. And so as of 2020, excuse me, 2019 and 2020, we have approximately 1,100 employees that have become what we call participants or employee owners of the company. And so they are beneficial owners of the company. We already talked about the Rancho San Miguel format. I uh, did want to note that we do also have a food for less format, which is a price impact and it's a franchise store. So we have 16 of those stores north of Bakersfield and up through uh, Sacramento. The Rio Linda is our furthest north store that we uh, just recently opened up last year. Uh, an ESOP, which is an employee stock ownership plan, is a retirement plan and all of how an ESOP is operated is regulated by the IRS. So for example, to become a participant in the ESOP, there's a minimum age of 21 years of age. There's a minimum of 1,000 hours that need to be worked each year. Um, and then you need to still stay with the company as of 1231, which is the end of every plan year. So those are really the simple three items that would entitle an employee to become an employee owner or a participant. They become a participant by getting allocated shares and the shares are allocated based on two factors. One is years of service with the ESOP and the second being their W-2 wages. So the more hours they work, the more they advance themselves up through the organization, the more their W-2 wages will be. Uh, the longer they stay with the company, the larger their proportionate allocation will be overall. 
shares are being allocated out over 35 years. So as of right now, we've had two 35th of the shares allocated out to those, em those employees, those roughly 1,100 em employees. Share value grows over time, which is obviously a, the, the purpose of a retirement plan. And that is by IRS design to be there to build up so that when individuals look to retire, they would have a, a retirement balance in place there to, to help them to, to retire out. It takes six years for an employee to fully vest in the shares that they are being allocated. The first year, there's no vesting. The second year is 20%. Each subsequent year to the sixth year is another 20%. So if you stay six years, then you'll have 100% vesting in place. The ESOP is a trust and is managed by a trustee. He's an independent individual for which the company uh, has to pay his fees. The trustee independently values those shares each year. And that is the basis for the share value for the employee owner's value and for their retirement amounts. And then uh, I did want to note that the company has five board members. My, I am one of the board members. The two of the selling shareholders are the other two. But as required by ESOP rules and the trustee, we have two independent board members, a grocery industry expert and an ESOP expert. And so with that, that was what I had planned to speak to, but I'll take questions uh, from anybody. Any oh. questions about the ESOP specifically? And then there was a question about the, um, just the zip codes. Um, but first, first, let's talk ESOP, if anybody has. I have a question then. Um, so, so it's the ESOP is like a, you know, it sounds like an investment plan, right? Do you guys also offer a like 401k match for employees so they can invest in their, you know, save for retirement as well as kind of save for retirement through the ESOP? We do as well have a 401k plan. It, uh, it's a contribution plan. And uh, last year we contributed to that it's a it's on election. It's not uh, required every year. It depends on the company's performance. Uh, last year we exceeded our plan, and so uh, we made that contribution uh, at the with the approval of the board of directors. So yes, we do have those two retirement plans again: the ESOP and the four hundred one k plan. Great, thanks. Okay, then I think, um, Adrian, we had a request to have uh, one of our participants speak from, in this case, her perspective, and that's why we have O.C. Johnson with us, uh, longtime employee, so has the perspective of prior company and then the, the last two years, roughly, uh, as an ESOP entity. I'll let her speak uh, herself. Um, when I started with the company 30 years ago, I started, it was just a part-time job that I had because I wanted to pay off my car because I had a, a full-time job. So it was a really good company. You can move up. Um, everyone was nice. And I've been here 30 years and there's a lot of uh, growth in the company. It's a very good company to work for. I tell everyone that you know, it, of course it has its ups and downs like everything else, but it is a very good company to work for. I wouldn't have been here 30 years plus if it wasn't. Adrian, do you have any questions or anybody for OC? Uh, it looks like Matthew Burgess has a question. Okay. Yes, I'll say, uh, well, congratulations. That's a testament to, uh, to be there for 30 years. Um, with the company. I, I, did, I did have a question for you. Um, you said you've been there for 30 years. So have you been at various locations, store locations? Yes, I have been at about six different locations. And when I started, I started as a cashier and then I worked my way up, but I've worked at actually all seven locations that we have here. 
Okay. And for the time that you've been there, how many black suppliers have you known to be um, on the shelves at that market there? Uh, well, that I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. But you've been there for 30 years? Well, yes, but I haven't, I don't deal with the marketing part of the buyers or who comes in and that kind of, that sort of stuff. No, I'm, I'm just, okay, okay, fair. Your, your focus, your focus is not really on the equity of this company, which we pride ourselves in. It's on the suppliers who supply this company. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, well yes, uh, Chris, I, I think it's, 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 it's twofold. So it's, it's both the employees, but also it, it's been an uh, issue with the supply chain here, um, which is really a focus. And so again, if you go to some of your local stores, even like, let's say, hey, uh, Nugget, you know, or Rayleigh's, a lot of those folks would know some of the suppliers that are local to their region that would come in. And for the mere fact that um, as cashier that's been there for 30 years and they can't tell me that there's, you know, they're not familiar, which, okay, that's, that's, a, that's fair. I'm, I, I wanna know that information because I think that's important. Yeah, um, but I'm, I'm yes. I'm not sure it's a fair question for her to understand the suppliers, right? That, that would be something we do. And again, and we haven't vetted our suppliers. We didn't vet UNFI and say, what is your uh, equity practice, right? Or inclusivity. We, we went out for our 1800 employees and bought the uh, best program we could, negotiated the best cost, the freshest fruit to help them for their retirements and their futures. Yes, I understand that, Chris. Um, but at the same time, the retirement futures, and I, I get all that. I do. I'm, I'm not arguing with that that point with you. I, I asked a question to make a point. Um, as a, a 30 year employee of a company, you know that prides itself in equity. I find it alarming that, you know, as a cashier, you wouldn't have known or seen a supplier, even a local supplier, that come in your store, or you wouldn't know of that product. Um, if we, if we look at that really things that are on the shelf, we can determine who that company represents. And so, again, that's bringing light to a situation that we've had discussions about and we continue to have discussions, but really, it's really peeling back the onion. And so if it's within the, we move into the DNA of every aspect of your employees to the CEO, to the grocery shopper, it's important, it is. And so I'm not going to be a dead horse, but I asked a question because I can tell you if I've been somewhere 30 years, I'm going to know a supplier that looks like me on the show. Well, not no, if you're see, a cashier, that, that, you would not know that. that, that wait, no, wait. Yeah. Hey, Matthew, that's not fair. So you're talking about people that come in and service our store. See, I'm confused. When, when, when we buy meat from Iowa beef packing plant in Iowa, I don't know what the context and makeup is of the beef we get and the people are cutting the beef. I know the people that come into our store are, are, are a, a meritage of all different uh, race colors. Yes. That, and, and so to ask OC who's cutting beef in Iowa, that's really not a fair question to ask if the gentleman is delivering it, what his ethnic makeup is. Well, that's a whole other question. I think she can answer that. Correct. Okay, so to ask her, she's ringing up, let's just take a ketchup. Okay, she's ringing up a ketchup for at the cashier stand, right? Sure. Let's let's this. Okay, so is it fair to say, look at this product and say, oh wow, this is um, Heinz, right? Oh, this is a local supplier that I know that was in the community. I'm I'm trying to see if there's any if there's been any within the DNA of Rancho San Miguel Market of a local supplier that's in that community. I if it's a product, right? So my my question was coming from that I aspect. See. Not that yeah, it's not fair for me to ask her yeah, of anything, but again, if, if there's been, maybe it's a flour, maybe it's a barbecue sauce, maybe it's a whatever it is, because you have community members that are engaged. Oh yeah, I know this individual, right? So that's tying into the community and yeah. that's bringing OC into that community as well and saying, okay, so maybe fair I asked the question incorrectly. Fair question, Matthew. I would tell you that over the years we have had uh, local entrepreneurs of every different race, color, or creed come out with different products and we chalk as barbecue yeah, sauce. We absolutely yeah, accepted. The, the truth is we do that in predatory markets where there's niche markets and, and people, uh, we see it a lot on the coast uh, in the Southern California coast, small entrepreneurs with beef jerky companies. Uh, so absolutely, if there is a, 
niche item in a neighborhood uh, or in a community that makes sense. We're all over that. We, we're, we're here to be successful and uh, have a successful, be successful in the community and, and, and with all of our yeah. co-owners. So absolutely. I, I've seen a lot more of that entrepreneurship in the Hispanic uh, arena with tortillas and salsas. Yeah. Uh, but absolutely, yes, we're, we're very much interested in that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And sorry for not phrasing the question. That's, yeah, yeah, okay. We, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I think we're, you know, we're here uh, having this conversation in order to ensure that, you know, Rancho San Miguel at 4401 Broadway is a success. I think we all want it to be a success. So, so that's the conversation. Uh, so there was a, go ahead, Bill. Sorry, Adrian. Um, I, I think that is our presentation. So my final slide, but I took it down so everybody could see each other as they're talking, uh, was just open questions, if there's anything else. Okay, well, I, I'd like to, to backtrack just a little bit to, um, to some stuff in the chat. So we had, we had Stacy Willett, who um, asked about the specific four zip codes that were shared in the presentation. I don't know if you're able to just repeat those without sharing your slides, but um, it looks like those zip codes also, you know, covered some some wealthier areas uh, a little bit further from the corner of Stockton Broadway. And there was a, a request from from a community member to see if there was any way to prioritize the specific Oak Park, um, uh, you know, uh, more under resourced zip codes, particularly 95817 and 95820 in hiring. Um, I don't know if that's something you'd have the ability to target or a goal that you can set, um, but specifically 95817 and 95820. Over, over the other couple, um, that was something that was called out. So um, I can tell you that we did not select the zip codes and those were the zip codes the city asked us to take a look at. Uh, I can tell you we will try our best. Uh, I don't wanna give any false assurances that it uh, will be easy to accomplish, but um, you know, certainly we'll try to get it as close to the store as possible makes it easier for the employees to get to the store, right? Because not all of them have vehicles. So a, lot of, a lot of our employees walk to work, bike to work. So you, 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 we can Bill, try that. Yeah, on a fair note, if, if we can get 50 or 60 people that live around that store, literally around the block, we would love to have them. It would be our first pick if, if that's available. Great. And then there was another question uh, also from Stacy about uh, what what types of healthcare benefits do you offer to your to your employees uh, at other stores? Bill, I'll let you answer that. Can he hear? Is he froze? Yeah, it looks a little frozen. Hopefully, he'll catch up to us. Benefit plan for our employees. So it is a self-insured plan. It borders on a PPO type plan. So it's not an HMO plan, and it has a very minimal contribution by the employees towards that, as well as it provides dental and vision care. Okay. And then there was a, a question just from Jennifer Wood, and, and I think this was previously discussed, but um, is your produce department equipped to source locally grown produce? Can you repeat the question? Is your, your produce department equipped to source locally grown pro produce? Is there a possibility for that? Yeah, yeah, look, it, again, it goes back to uh, the conversation with Matthew. If there is a, a supply, a supplier who can continuously supply us produce and the cost uh, work for the A, the community to purchase them uh, and B, for us to sell them, a lot of times the word local is a real big buzzword. And then when, when I put local grapes out there at $1.48 a pound versus some from Southern California at 99 cents a pound, uh, local doesn't move as well. But uh, again, back to, to Matthew and the conversation, we're absolutely interested in being local. If local is relevant there, we want to be have a, have a local flavor. Uh, but it's got to sell, right? At the end of the day, we have to sell groceries and produce and meat. Thank you. And it looks like Aziza I, I has wanna, a, go ahead. <laughs> you already know. Um, so I agree with that. Um, local grown produce totally fits the culture of Oak Park and the surrounding area. Just to reassure and kind of emphasize that idea, this community, specifically this neighborhood, 
we want that. I and so, that. yeah, so definitely a priority speaking on it, like if I may speak on behalf, you know, of a group of people who would, I know it would in fact want that. So um, let's make that happen for sure. Any other questions? I know Matt, Matthew Burgess uh, turned his video back on, so he probably has a question, but I want to make sure others who haven't had a chance to speak yet have a, have the opportunity to elevate elevate specific things. Okay, Matthew, did you have something? I won't take the floor. I'll let somebody else ask a question. I'm probably <laughs> tired of being asked a question. So I'll let somebody else speak. Yeah. Well, I, I asked and, and I didn't hear anything. Maybe maybe it's something I'll, I'll throw out there is that so the Oak Park Neighborhood Association, we, we supported the, so the city um, and maybe I don't know if, if Bill or someone could could speak to just the, the city of Sacramento loan that was approved on April 6th to rehab the building. Um, uh, could, could someone maybe start with that and then I'll, I'll add some context. Sure. Um... To be candid with you, we did not know about that until late in the process. So when I started negotiating with the landlord last summer for that location, um, one of the requirements we had as part of making the deal work for us um, was getting some tenant improvements because we've got to go in and convert it from the food source to a rancho with a kitchen and a bakery, right, scratch bakery all the, the things that we showed you on the slides. Uh, so we required a million one uh, tenant improvement allocation. That then evidently came out through the city with the bond and we're supportive of that. I'm glad that was able to be the source of the financing or funding for the landlord, but uh, it is to go directly into the store. It, it, we've got a bunch of work to be done. We're just now coming out of plan check and we think the store will be opened up towards middle to late October at this point in time. Um, so I don't know what else you need me to speak to about that, but uh, that's what we know about it. No, I think I think that context is helpful. Um, and, and we submitted, so the Oak Park Neighborhood Association supported that that financing uh, for to rehab the building in, in order to enable um, a grocery, a grocer to move in and in order to enable uh, Oak Park to not no longer be a food desert. So we were supportive of that. And I did uh, uh, upload the letter that we sent to city council on the topic um, in the chat just now. And so just wanted to call to attention a couple of the things that, so we, we had some ideas uh, in there um, uh, with respect to some of the, some of the items that we've talked about. Um, we did talk about consistent hiring of residents from 95817 and 95820, which we previously talked about. We did talk about square footage, you know, dedicated to fresh produce. One of the, the items that, that we called out in our letter that again is in the chat was having a cold prepared meals in addition to hot prepared meals. The, 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 um, the reasoning there is that uh, for EBT, that's really important because there's a, for, for particularly low income folks, there's a differentiation in their EBT between hot food and, and, and groceries slash cold food, and it allows them more access to prepared meals. So is that something that you're, you're able to do uh, to allow cold, cold meals uh, and to have that EBT differentiation? So I'm going to punt that to uh, Chris. I, yeah, you speak to that. yeah, so uh, again, we're, we're tight in that area. And, and I'm not sure with respect to the EBT and, and the, the food. Uh, are you guys, we're part of a pilot program right now that I think is coming in Sacramento with EBT with respect to hot food. Are you familiar with it? I am not, but I think we, you know, we have some folks from the Sacramento Food Policy Council on. I'll, um, maybe they can add something, but please continue. So we currently are with Merced and we're filling out applications for EBT on a uh, select menu on the hot foods. That's not dismissing the cold food conversation, but we think that's going to be a, a really good program. Uh, so we have filled out the applications. We're moving forward on that. And I did see that it's, uh, and I don't know what's particular region in Sacramento, that Sacramento is on the list, and maybe I can stand corrected. Uh, with respect to uh, the cold food, absolutely. We want to accommodate, we understand uh, EBT. Uh, we're very EBT friendly, and, and uh, we understand the dyma dynamics of the neighborhood, and uh, absolutely. All right, and I wanted to just 
call out two more of the suggestions in our letter that again, you can access in chat. The first one was uh, building new partnerships with like com local composters to ensure that, you know, produce that, that for example, doesn't get used is either donated to local food banks or food pantries or is, um, you know, utilized for compost. Um, you have uh, any ideas about that? We, we, if somebody wants to pick it up, we're happy to give it to them. All right. Take, maybe, we might be taking you up on that. We'll see. <laughs> uh, any, other, any other questions? Matthew, I, I know <laughs> kind of took it away from you, but let's go with Charles Ware first. <laughs> I was wondering, um, the old food source had a recycle center in the parking lot. And I know that uh, one of the requirements for a recycle center is that to be within 500 feet, I believe it is, of a grocery store. Is that something, um, is it a possibility to put back in this neighborhood? Because we don't have one currently. How so long ago was that? Oh, maybe three years ago. I don't remember a recycling center, but okay. Yeah, it was right there, uh, right by Chase. I remember okay. it. Okay. I remember it. Yeah, I don't know if recycling centers have to be that close because there's there was a recycling center on 24th and Broadway for yeah, a long time, and uh, that's you know there aren't any grocery stores around there, but who knows? Well, there is on Second Avenue. Okay. All right. Well, Tompkins is right there around the corner, but um, and I know the one on Stockton and Fruit Ridge. But that's been a real big issue uh, in the old park area because now you have to go way to Stockton Boulevard or the 24th, you know, and a lot of people don't have that kind of transportation. Is it is it fair for me to say I'll research it and get back to you? No problem. Okay. All right, Matthew, you're up. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Um, Chris, thank you guys. Bill, thank you. I appreciate you all. Um, just a couple of questions that I wanted. I th you answered it a little bit, and I know you guys are are tight on a space for that particular store. But I, I did want to go back and ask just the question to see maybe um, is there an area or and again I, I know things have to sell, but is there space to have designated um, shelving space or for for those local suppliers? Do you guys have designate locations for that? Um, or is it, or, or is this store gonna be one of those things where it's uh, be really confined in space? But again, every store has a lineup. So I wanted to try and see if there's something that's carved out or that could be possibly carved out. Um, and that's for dry goods, as well as your, you know, across the board, whether it's a produce aisle section, whether it's a shelf space where it's a dry, uh, dry foods, um, what have you. Is that something that could be done, Chris? Yeah, so here, here, it all comes down, Matthew, and the answer is yes. Look it, if the product sells, we're, we're here to sell groceries. So if I set up a, let's say you have a restaurant and you had a great sauce that, that, that's locally popular and we wanna be part of that local flavor and we wanna support local entrepreneurship. The answer is yes, right? So we put that product on our shelf if it moves and, and, and there's velocity, you know, we constantly look at our shelves, uh, look at the, the, the numbers. And if something, we're constantly pulling things in and putting things out. So if there are local things that sell that the local neighborhood wants, we would be foolish not to bring it in. So Thank you, Chris. Uh, Matthew, hey, Matthew let, me, let me jump in on that if I can, everybody. Okay. Part of the layout of the store there's a lot of prep work. So we're gonna to wanna to understand those parameters earlier on than, than October, right? Um, so I don't know, Matthew, if you're the gentleman that we would get that information from. And to Chris's point, do we have a feel for like how many items we're talking about, whether it's dry or produce or whatever the, the department is and how much volume movement you might be thinking? Cause that'll help us identify how much space on the shelf that's gotta be dedicated for that. That'd be helpful. The, the other thing, Matthew, will be supply chain consistency, right? Yes. So what, 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 what we can do, and, and believe me, we're nimble enough to do this. So we've worked with local people who would actually deliver it to our store in a truck. The, the, the key to that, though, Matthew, is that they can't not deliver it for a week and, and us be out of stock for a week. So we're big enough and small enough to manage that type of business. And we have done that in a multitude of locations. We would need 
again, and I, I would love you to give me a couple examples because then I could speak to it really probably specifically. I can speak to it. Please. Um, so we would need a, probably about a half an aisle or less, a third of an aisle of bulk grains on one side of the aisle. And it would include grains such as red lentils, yellow lentils, uh, garbanzo beans, black beans, basmati rice, um, maybe dried fruit, nuts, um, candied items, things like that. Things that we can see at the co-op, for example. Um, and that would be sufficient. And even if it was like, if, if it wasn't like bins on the wall, it could be bags and you could have bulk bags of beans, bulk bags of rice and yeah. other uh, Is, grains, it, so, like quinoa. Yeah, th those, many of those items will be there. Now, are you asking those to be local or just to be that to be part of the itemization on the shelf? I think those should be things that are uh, in bulk available to the community. Oh. Bulk has been a challenge for us during COVID. Uh, we, we will have sealed bags. Uh, the ranchers are not big bulk users. And, and, and to be honest with you, uh, unless it's a gravity fed bulk bin, uh, we've kind of gotten away from bulk during COVID with people putting their hands in there and that stuff. Uh, right, but so even, a, even bags would be cool. We, we, we will have bags of, of many of those things and as, Look, at, if we get it wrong when we get there, and, we'll, and believe me, we're going to try to do everything to get it right, but we have uh, customer request forms and comment cards at every checkout. So if we didn't have, for example, lentils and, and, and somebody's requesting it and we get a couple of requests, in all likelihood, we're going to get lentil in there. Uh, but that, that, that's part of our itemization I, I, I guess I was talking, I thought Matthew and I were talking more about local, the local flavor and specific things. Right, and yeah, and to, just to speak to that, um, Chris, I, I, and I was, I was talking about more of a lot of, you know, a lot of our local uh, suppliers are, we're talking about uh, uh, sauces, hot sauces, barbecue sauces, we're talking about um, packaged meat products, we're talking um, spices. Of, of those nature, which are more of the, oh, okay. I guess, condiments. And um, in, in addition to, you know, we have our local beers as well. Um, and so that's something that's huge in a niche market here locally um, in looking at that. I, I would love for actually to sit down and talk, maybe one day have a cup of coffee and you can educate me on a serious note on some of the local flavor because we want to uh, do it where it makes sense. And yet, in all candor, we have some a lack of understanding uh, to the extent that you guys do of what is local. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's fair. I think locals within a hundred miles. Well, um, so uh, local. again, lo but I mean, local. That's the standard. Well, uh, I'm first of all, we'll, we'll go. Yeah. I'm not going to split hairs over what local is because again, when we talk about 100 miles and all that stuff, you're you're accenting a, a lot of people out. Um, I'm not going to get into the history of us not owning our farms anymore. Um, so when people say this farm to fork, fork 100 miles, well, it excludes people like me because our farms were taken. So now we fall into the category of suppliers. Right. Um, right. I'm a huge advocate because we've made it, but I need to help other people, and we made it um, unconventionally, right? And so. I'm about the community, I'm about the solutions, and I'm the one here to help you all so that we can be successful, we can have the equity, and we can be exclusive. Um, and I, I am California. I mean, my great-great-grandfather was brought here as a slave. We had farmland, so I know it. Um, I look forward to the conversation, Chris. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any yeah. More? Any more? It looks like there's a, a comment in the chat about uh, fresh juice drinks. Uh, are you going to have kind of a fresh fruit juice? Yeah, yeah. So we'll even we'll even make some there. Uh, we'll make some fresh juice squeezes and stuff. Again, it, it's it's critical to know that we're not we're not Nugget and we're not Whole Foods. We're Ranch of San Miguel, but we will have fresh juices and we'll make our own fresh drinks there. And they're and they're very good. Thank you. 
Any other questions for uh, the PAQ team while we have them? I just want to comment um, <clears throat> that, you know, this is going to be such an important relationship that we share with this grocery store. And we appreciate you guys um, doing this question and answer session with us. And I know that we've asked some hard questions and we sound like we're being demanding. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately, you guys are coming in as a space that is so necessary in this community. And as long as we all come into that amicably and we are working together, this could be a great opportunity for the community as well as your business. And I know that our community will support your business if you're supporting our community. I thank you. And I have to tell you, we're, we're very excited to be there and to learn. Yeah, I appreciate those words, Aziza. Yeah. So um, we're excited to learn. Uh, this store was exciting when we first saw it. We think we can do a great job for you. And we think uh, you'll be proud of us uh, when we open up. So look forward to working with you guys as we develop our store plan. Well, thank you. And as you know, likewise, we, we look forward to working with you as well, um, realizing some of those ideas that we've laid out and, and, uh, and being, you know, uh, customers. You know, I, I live I live just down the street on Fourth Avenue. Um, I was sad to see food source close as well. Look forward to utilizing the new the new store. Thank you. Thank you. So, and any final final comments? Adrian, Last... if you like food source, you're really gonna like Rancho San Miguel. Great, <laughs> glad to hear it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, hey, thank you so much. Feel free to stay on. We're, we're just going to go into some, some other neighborhood announcements and conversation, but uh, you're more than welcome to, to, to continue to hang out with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, folks. Well, uh, again, that was kind of the, the highlight for, for today. Um, do, do folks have specific announcements that they'd like to share? Uh, anything going on in the neighborhood? Um, I have a couple of things, but want to open it up first. Well, I might actually call on Aziza um, to talk about, Aziza, are you available to uh, talk a little bit about Oak Park Cares, the new program that we launched recently? Sure, well, I'm in the check stand buying my fruit. Oh. <laughs> uh, so basically, um, Oak Park Cares is a shining light. It's an incredible um, project we're working on that we're really proud of. Um, we get to help our community in ways that matter. Uh, so we are basically have set up a committee within our board of the Oak Park Neighborhood Association. And um, some, of our, some of our sitting members, uh, board members will be on that committee. And hopefully, you know, we'll talk about maybe bringing in some community um, voices on that committee. Uh, overall, the project basically is a, pilot where we can you guys handle the thank you here's the card <laughs> uh, the pilot is basically um the community who has been hit by covid and has had been economic economically impacted by the situation can apply on our link uh to complete an application and be reviewed for um funds to help them cover a bill uh, so they can um, complete that we've already opened up. We've, we probably have over 50 applications at this point, and we are actively accepting uh, new applicants and issuing funds to our community. So this is a great project. We're really excited. We need businesses in the community and other donors to contribute to the fund for this project. And um, Anybody can apply. It's, it's supposed to be and designed to be low barrier. Um, yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Aziza, for, for that overview. And folks can go to, um, I, I pasted in the chat, Aziza, the, the link that folks can go to to access the application. You can also, mm -hmm. uh, as Aziza said, um, donate to the, to the program uh, via our OKNA's PayPal. You just go to oakparkna.com and there's a PayPal link right there. So we, we yeah, encourage you to, we... to share that. Adrian, I had a question. Yeah, what's up? 
Uh, can you give me some type of an example of what type of uh, uh, items or, or what would be eligible for that? Yeah, so so any sort of like bill assistance is, is eligible. Folks just, they need to be 18. They need to be um, an Oak Park resident. Um, again, the application has some some sort of stipulations. You know, we do want evidence that they are paying their bill with, with the, the money. Um, but it could be a smud bill. It could be rent. It could be a car payment. It could be a health you know, it could be a hospital bill. Uh, any of those are eligible. All right. So say I have an elderly person who has trouble getting in and out of their house and they need some like uh, handicap rails or something. I, I I would say, I would absolutely say yes to that. What would, what would you say, Aziza? Um, I didn't catch it, but um, other items like um, even- Putting up- Aziza, oh, putting up handrails, putting up handrails, uh, a disabled person actually putting safety infrastructure into their home. Oh, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Well, that can be discussed within the um, commission that's going to be looking over all the applications. But I think that we're, you know, we got even applications for um, hotel stays, some of our unhoused neighbors. Yeah. Right? So it's going to be a case by case basis. Uh, very much personal, come, contacting the person, hearing them out, doing a, um, a, a review with each individual person. So, I mean, if our board decides we want to do handrails for handicap, that we can do that. Uh, yeah, and I would we, add- we, we, would have, we would have to vote on it. Yeah, I would add that, you know, a person in, you know, if a person wants to put handrails or needs to put handrails into their home, they probably have bills to pay. They probably have rent. They probably have other, other items. So apply, you know, I, would encourage, you know, them to apply both, you know, from the lens of, of the handrails uh, uh, that is needed as well as, you know, just the smud. <laughs> they also okay. yes. hey, Andy, you, you've unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? No, I'm sorry. Uh, so Charles, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I know they also need some help. Uh, like one of the, the floors in the in the bathroom or something are real uh, corroded and dry rot. So I know they need some help in that area too. But I'll go ahead and go online and look and just uh, sit down with them and you know try to figure out what their exact needs are. Yeah. Well, pl and please share. Thank you for that question. So I have another couple of couple of announcements. Um, so one is, one is about slow streets in Oak Park. Uh, as many of you recall, there was a uh, survey that, that actually closed on the 31st uh, about a proposed slow streets route uh, through Oak Park. And I'm actually gonna share my screen real quick and show you the route. Uh, it's right there. I'm actually gonna, maybe gonna zoom in here so you can see it. Um, so it's basically uh, 9th Avenue uh, to between 32nd and MLK and then 8th Avenue from roughly MLK to Stockton. And again, the idea of slow streets is to um, close them to through traffic and make them you know, safe places to hang out uh, and, um, and uh, spend time with, with your neighbors. Um, and anyway, so that survey has been out and we hope to get responses, uh, final responses on that soon from the city of Sacramento. Again, it's a city of Sacramento program to to close um, streets to, to through traffic. Of course, residents can still access the streets and emergency vehicles and delivery vehicles as well. I just wanted to, to throw that out there. And then there's uh, another ex update I'm particularly excited about with respect to environmental justice. Um, so so I, I work for a nonprofit called Valley Vision and we're working with several other nonprofits to deploy air monitors around Oak Park in North Sacramento. Um, the, uh, the, the folks we're working with are, are Walk Sacramento, uh, Breathe California, and Green Tech Education, uh, all of whom have, have footprints in Oak Park to some extent. Uh, and I just wanted to share with you the, um, the places where we're putting these air monitors because we've deployed um, the majority of them. We're, we're putting 21 total between, between North Sac and Oak Park. Um, and they've been, as I said, a majority have been deployed. So let me just share my screen. The purpose of this is to um, secure funding to monitor our air quality. Um, and this will be the, the data from these air monitors cited around Oak Park will be available to the public. You'll be able to see um, live air monitoring data um, come in. And you'll also be able to see, um, um, you know, kind of what, 
what pollution levels are, are, are being experienced by folks in these specific on these specific blocks. So the idea is to try to secure resources from the state of California to address a lot of these environmental injustices. Um, and, and then I'll, so, so again, these are the, the locations in Oak Park, uh, pretty good coverage between uh, Central, North and South Oak Park. Um, and then I'm gonna zoom out and shift over to North Sacramento. Uh, again, these are the, the sites that we've, that, that we're beginning to place monitors in North Sacramento. So a majority of the monitors are already placed. They're solar powered. Um, they've been, we've been working with residents and local businesses to put them up. A few of you on this call have, have helped me either connect with residents to put these up or, or host to them yourself. So I, I really do appreciate that. Um, but I'll, I'll post a link to, to that project in, in the chat so you can read more about it. But just know that we're working on a public data portal and, and we'll hopefully, hopefully be getting some investment in, in the neighborhood to help, uh, help uh, improve our air quality. Any, any questions about uh, any, any of what we've talked about or anything else folks would like to announce? Any, any further thoughts on the, the, um, the Rancho San Miguel conversation earlier? Any, anything folks would like to add? <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you all again. It's, it's, uh, we've been on, on the line for about an hour 15. I uh, really have appreciated this conversation. It was really, really rich conversation about, about the, the grocery store coming into the neighborhood. And I think, um, we, we left them with, with a lot of ideas and, and things to think about and, and you know, look forward to working with them to make sure that, that it's a success and it's you know, appropriate for our community. Sounds like Charles, you have you know. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Is uh, Hillary still available? She's on the line. Hil uh, what's your question? You have a question for Hillary? Yeah, I was, um, when hey, is Charles. How you doing, Ms. Hillary? Do you Good. know what the next um, District 5 homeless uh, plan meeting is? The master planner for X Street. No, for well, for District Five. So, we're, are you talking about the District Five wide plan or just for X Street? Both, either one. Fine. Um, so X Street ran away until they select the operator. Which would um, be? Good. I am not entirely sure. It should be pretty soon, though. But we'll we'll for sure let you know. Um, and for the D Five Master Plan, I need to ask Jay we do need to circle back on that but you'll of course be included but hopefully soon okay got you thanks charles and i just had one other question this is sophia thompson i wanted to know is this the one and only meeting or are we going to have me uh, continue to have meetings in the near future before the project you know is fully executed talking specifically about rancher san miguel yes sir i'm sorry yeah, so so that's a really good question. And actually, those of us on uh, uh, the, as part of the Oak Park Neighborhood Association haven't had a chance to, to quite figure that out. But I think it'd be a great idea for us to, um, you know, have another one of these in a couple of months, uh, at, you know, if not earlier, to to follow up on some of the stuff that we talked about. Sounds like, um, you know, they want to they want to talk, talk to Matthew, they want to talk to others who have been vocal on this call uh, about specific specific items. And I think we need to you know, uh, make sure that make sure that those conversations are happening and that you know our input is taken into account. So I think we should absolutely have a follow up. Thanks, Sophia. I, I, I definitely think so. Just because I think this was a good start, a good, um, a good you know starting place for conversation. Um, but as I'm thinking, you know, and listening to others, I think there will um, other questions will be birthed out of this and things that I think need to be addressed before just um, moving forward. You know. Um, I just think it needs to be another follow-up. That's all. I'll say that. Hey, hey yeah. I have two quick questions. One is, um, do we have any idea when we're going back to in-person meetings at the community center? And also, uh, for the any either of the Burgess brothers, where can I get good barbecue? All right. Well, that, that second one sounds like an amazing closer to this meeting. So <laughs> I am going to answer the first one. Um, uh, we, we aren't entirely sure. We think as early as July, though, as, as early as July 1st. So uh, cool. we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted. Gotcha. We want to go back, too. We want to see everybody. Yeah. 
All right, Matthew, or it looks like Jonathan's not on the line anymore. Matthew, where can Charles get really good barbecue? Uh-oh. <laughs> no, I'm too long. I mean, right. you know, you got TNR right, right there in the neighborhood uh, on 4th yeah. Avenue. Um, well, steady smoke market on Saturday and Wednesdays. Okay. Also, uh, Momo's Meats has pretty good barbecue. Right on 58th and Broadway. Yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful question. Mm. Uh, all right. Anything else for the good of the order before we before we call it? And again, so actually, uh, this meeting, as you you know, was recorded. So we'll we'll add it to the Oak Park Neighborhood Association YouTube channel. We'll make sure that folks have access to the recording. Uh, again, there was a lot a lot of rich stuff discussed in the first hour of this meeting that we want we want folks to have access to. So um, that will be on YouTube. Keep an eye out uh, on the the OPNA uh, Facebook group as well as our email list. Uh, and if you don't have access to the OPNA emails, um, please go to oakparkna.com and sign up and you'll, you'll start getting emails from us. And Matthew, uh, Charles just hopped off, but I think he asked you where he can get really good barbecue. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I had to step away for a second. Yeah. Um, no, there's a, uh, huh, let's see, you know, I know Renegade's doing some pop-ups. He'll, they'll be around. Um, and you know, TNR is right over there. Momos is pretty good. Um, and uh, Burgess Brothers will be going to Sac State's campus. So, right on. It's exciting. Yeah. Did Did you have anything else to offer just on uh, takeaways from uh, our conversation today? Yeah, I just you know I want to thank you, Adrian, for you know having the space. Um, and really, I think really the the takeaway is is really that you know we in looking at it all is, is really having something. It, it's great to have a grocery store, but what's going to make the store different? That's going to make it local, you know? And I think that's where we have to really go and just really um, hold them accountable and peel those layers back to say, yes. Um, and I'm happy that I was able to make the call because I understand it, I understand grocery, right? I've done it. I know the challenges. And so um, that's why I asked the questions I wanted to ask to, to kind of draw them out. But I look forward to, um, I'll, I'll take Chris up on the call if you have his contact. So I'll reach out to him because I really do want to ensure that there, there's there's opportunity, right? For those that are local um, uh, within the supply chain. I mean, again, it, it, there's there's a lot of folks that could be represented even if they had something that was rotating, um, you know, but something designated for that, so. Yeah. Well, appreciate the... I appreciate your questions today, Matthew. I think it was really insightful and, and it did, really did draw out some key, you know, just some key details about the operation. Um, and of course, you know, if, if we're not holding space for these conversations, we're not doing our jobs as a neighborhood association. So quite frankly, so uh, glad you could make it and, you know, look forward to continued collaboration on this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you very much. All right, folks. Well, with that, uh, let's call it again. You can find a recording on YouTube. Um, thanks again for taking part of your Thursday out um, to spend time with us and enjoy the rest of your evening. All right, bye. Bye, Adrian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.